It is the pastor's heart and Dominic Steele and Truth is in trouble. We have a problem with Truth. Lionel Windsor is our guest. It was about 15 years ago and I was speaking on a church weekend away as a guest speaker at a large church conference here in Sydney and we came to question time after my presentation and I lost control of question time. Uh, I'd been teaching on the first part of Ephesians 4 and arguing in the presentation uh, that we should all aim to reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and that by truthing in love, speaking the truth in love, we would all collectively grow up into unity and understanding and maturity in the faith. And that's what we should pray for, long for and expect. And then somebody said, well, what about when we disagree on gender roles? Or what about when we disagree on sexuality? And then somebody else piled in. And what about when we disagree on denominations and then baptism and all sorts of things? And there was a pile on then of people disagreeing with me. And I have reflected back over that question time while washing the dishes. Um, you know, you do this, what could I have said? What should I have said? And I still think I was theologically correct in what I said on Ephesians 4, but I'm absolutely clear that I did not persuade. And uh, as I've thought about that exchange, I think now that I didn't think hard enough about the world that I was speaking to and the presuppositions that we collectively had brought and unconsciously taken on. Anyway, Lionel Windsor is a lecturer at Moore Theological College. He has this new book out, Truth Be Told, and I've had that moment of question time in my mind the whole time as I was reading your book, Lionel. Um, tell me, have you crashed and burned in question time? Oh, like yes. Oh, I've crashed and burned in various places, <laughs> in various pastoral situations, uh, in lots of ways, but including including uh, in uh, trying to argue for truth mm -hmm. uh, and including indeed uh, as, as people have, uh, have have read my book and responded to it. A few, really? a few people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As, as I've, I've heard uh, some responses. So, right. Yeah. OK. So, I mean, it is an issue for us in our pastor's hearts to mm. try to persuade people of the mm. truth. But before we get to some of the solutions and some of the scriptures, mm. let's just get you to define a little on what's going on in the cultural milieu. Because wherever it was 15 years ago for me, mm. it's much more complex now. <laughs> yes. In one sense, it's more complex. In another sense, maybe there's a glimmer of hope that it's becoming um, a, a, little, a little better in some mm -hmm. ways. Now, uh, where are we in, in, in the cultural moment? Uh, we've lived through through postmodernism. Mm -hmm. uh, postmodernism is a reaction to modernism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> modernism uh, is uh, a, uh, in the Enlightenment, uh, a, a time when people were very confident that we as human beings could all come to a, a knowledge of what is true, what is objectively true. Postmodernism uh, is a movement, a philosophical movement, a cultural movement uh, that says, no, we can't. Uh, and so is uh, greatly, uh, has, has, has very little or no confidence in actually coming to a sense of, of truth. Now, as Christians, we have lived in and we are growing, uh, we've grown up in uh, that kind of cultural moment. Mm. So I guess what you were dealing with, as I've dealt with and, and as we are dealing with, is this sense, not, not, it's not simply that I disagree with you. Uh, in the Enlightenment times uh, and in the modern times, people would disagree with each other, but they would have a sense that even though we're disagreeing with each other, there is an objective truth to be found. And as long as we keep disagreeing with each other uh, well, we'll be able to find it. Mm -hmm. The postmodern idea is, no, you can't. Uh, but you say we've lived through it. Indeed. In a, in a sense of past tense, I, I yes. pick up. Yeah. Yes. So uh, one of the things that uh, I found as I was writing this book is, is was people. And when I say people, I'm not talking so much about Christians. I'm talking about uh, presidents, former presidents. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a friend of mine um, who has uh, been quite, uh, quite, yeah, quite high up in, uh, in, in the government broadcaster here, uh, the, the ABC. In, in Canberra, uh, who's not a Christian as far as I know, uh, various people who have been saying this whole idea that there's no such thing as objective truth is disastrous. Well, let's just watch a quote that you draw, drew to my attention mm. um, from former President Barack Obama. Mm. Um, and he's speaking a couple of years after he finished in the presidency in 2016. Mm. So we're um, perhaps 2018. So Donald Trump is in power. Mm. We'll just watch that clip now. Unfortunately, too much of politics today seems to reject the very concept of objective truth. 
People just make stuff up. <laughs> they, they just make stuff up. We see the, the utter loss of shame among political leaders where they're caught in a lie and they just double down and they lie some more. It used to, look, let me say, politicians have always lied, but it used to be if you caught them lying, they'd be like, oh man. <laughs> now they just keep on lying. They, they just... Now, Barack Obama there is speaking in a world where we've got um, uh, Donald Trump using lines like, um, that's fake news, <laughs> um, yes. and 30,000 or something mistruths or um, uh, misrepresentations of the fact, according to, I think it was the, the Washington Post. That was Post. the Washington Post, yeah. yeah, which has it in for him, but yes, yeah. exactly, yeah. Mm. Um, but you were saying five presidents. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I, I've, uh, so, so in, in preparation for this this book, I mean, the, the centre of the book is, is the Bible, but the first part of it is looking at uh, various parts of our culture. And so in preparation, I did a lot of reading. And mm -hmm. One of the books I read uh, was a book by, um, I think his name's Nick Bryant. Um, he's a BBC, BBC journalist, yeah. yeah. And he was looking at uh, five presidencies before uh, 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 before Trump and was looking at precedents uh, for uh, for Donald Trump, you know, looking at uh, Reagan's um, use of the media and use of TV and the, the, the emoting of the nation mm -hmm. and looking at... Uh, and moving from, if you like, the facts of the written word in the newspaper to the emotional... Yeah, yeah, the emotional, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Bill Clinton, yeah. uh, you know, the famous, you know, uh, issues to do with um, his, his infidelity. Yeah. Uh, and so him I saying, did not have sexual relations with that woman. With that woman. Yeah. And yeah. he had to... Then, then when he was challenged on that and it was obvious that he did, he said, well, you didn't understand what the word is meant. You know, uh, there, there is no relationship, he said. Right, yeah. You didn't understand what the word is meant in and, that sentence. And I did not have sexual relationships. She had sexual relationships with me. But, <laughs> exactly, <yeah. laughs> yes. Uh, so various precedents. Uh, so um, what I, I think what, what I sensed in Obama almost, and I, I'm not only paraphrasing him at this point, but um, uh, giving, giving a sense of the moment is, we have grown, the, the, the second half of the 20th century is, is postmodern. The idea that there is no such thing as objective truth. And the idea of postmodernism uh, was that if we could just get rid of the idea of objective truth, we could just get rid of the idea of this you know, ultimate authority, then things would be fantastic because we'd be able to just live together and it would be just wonderful uh, because there'd be no authority, there'd be mm -hmm. no you know, terrible authority over us. And the sense um, is that that seems to be what Donald Trump has taken seriously, mm -hmm. uh, and he's just running with it. And Barack Obama is saying, no, when we said there's no such thing as objective truth, we didn't mean that. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't mean what has actually happened. And that is relationships uh, are, 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 are disastrous when there's no, no sense of objective truth standing over the top of us. It's just whoever is the most powerful wins. Mm -hmm. uh, so postmoderns would say, well, really, truth is just power. You know, it's just about the will to power. Uh, and so that means that powerful people come along and who can ever, whoever can spin the best narrative, who, whoever can tell the biggest victim story, whoever is able to persuade people powerfully is the one who wins. Now, I mean, let me just give you the quote that mm. jumped out at me mm. from Prince Harry, yes. as you quoted it in your book. Yes. Whatever the cause, my memory is my memory. It does what it does, gathers and curates as it sees fit. And there's just as much truth in what I remember and how I remember it as there is in so-called objective facts. Things like chronology and cause and effect are often just fables we tell ourselves about the past. Yes. And that's stark. And yet it's precisely what people have been taught uh, over the last, you know, 50 years, 60 years. And so if that's the that. presupposition that the person in question time has. Yes. How do I communicate it? I mean, that's the big question. How do I communicate as a yes. Bible teacher? Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh -huh. and, and I can go there if you like. No, no, no. Yeah, we <laughs> we'll just want to set up the problem. Yeah. Um, because, you, I mean, there's a, that's the problem we've got with um, the media, with mm. politics, with fake news. Mm. But there's a problem of loss of confidence in institutions. Yes. Um, and we'd probably even, I mean, we'd put 
universities, science, and even theological colleges in yeah, those institutions right. that we've lost confidence yeah. in, mm. and churches. And churches. Yeah. Um, mm. But then also there's actually a problem in our hearts. So yes. let's do institutions, then our hearts. Yeah. Okay, yes. So uh, one of the, uh, the, the the points I was making is that uh, to function well, an institution is just a, uh, a, a set up with agreed rules in society mm. that enable us to live together well and to, to get things done together. Uh, that includes things like education, the, the things that you listed. Uh, to work well, uh, institutions need authority. Mm -hmm. uh, now, authority is actually a good thing, uh, mm -hmm. but the the general uh, uh, postmodern idea uh, is that actually authority is is inherently a negative thing. We must constantly pull down authority. That's one thing. Secondly, uh, what's actually happened with many institutions in our society is that people have breached trust, mm. uh, and so to to make authority work, you need trust. And to make trust work, you need truthfulness and you need faithfulness. You need to be able to trust that the words that are said by the institutions actually are followed through. Uh, and in so many ways that, that trust has been breached and so we've lost authority. And I mean, as I was reading that uh, chapter, I was reflecting on the season we had during COVID and it yes. felt like we had a, a little season where our politicians were saying, we've got to trust the science, you know, and which yes. was kind of completely mm. out of step with the, the mood we'd been going in for 20 years. Exactly. But we've got mm. to trust the science. We've got to trust the science. And I was thinking, mm. OK, we've got to trust the science. Mm. But then actually the science didn't quite tell us the truth. You know? <laughs> and and, and uh, not only did it, uh, the, part of the issue with the science is you say you've got to trust the science, but but then there's the question of, uh, yes, but science is only ever there to tell you uh, what the consequences might be. Not, it doesn't actually tell you what to do. Mm. Uh, and so there's all those questions as well. So the politicians were also in, 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 in implicitly saying, you've got to trust us. Mm. Uh, and in a sense, uh, there was no other choice. We, we needed to, to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've actually seen a further loss and erosion of trust mm. because of the fact that, well, no one's perfect. Uh, and indeed, politicians are not perfect. And and the science is never 100% uh, perfect. And so we've lost uh, faith in, in, in that as, mm. as, as well. So. so what do you want to say from the, or actually our mm. hearts? Because there's actually yes. at root, yes. it's a problem with me. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's where I want to bring it. So in the book, um, I started with politics because politics is out there. Yeah. <laughs> and so I I'm can totally say, fine criticising them. <laughs> exactly, because they're politicians. Of course we criticise politicians. And then what I try to do is, is move it. I talk about uh, technology, social media, uh, institutions. Then I talk about um, the, the, the sort of postmodern philosophy. I talk about culture, you know, with Prince Harry and others. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I'm trying to do is narrow it down, or not narrow it down, I'm trying to bring it home. Mm -hmm. Because actually the issue is, I mean, even when it comes to politics, people have this phrase, speak the, speak the truth to power. Mm. And that the assumption there is that I'm truthful and they're powerful. Mm. Uh, and so I'm on the side of truth and they're on the side of, of, of evil. Mm -hmm. But actually the problem is us. Mm. Uh, the problem is is in us. Now that is clearly seen, well, you know, ho hopefully clearly seen when it comes to things like abuse, uh, where truthfulness, the lack of truthfulness and the lack of holding on to truth and faithfulness, keeping your word, is actually inherent in the dynamics of abuse. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it's not just uh, those deep uh, and, and you know, awful uh, issues of abuse. It's actually in each one of us. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I want to ask, and it's, it's got a question with the obvious answer, are you always truthful? You know, I ask myself that, am I always truthful? Mm. And there's only one answer. Well, there are two answers. If the answer is yes, then that proves I'm a liar. You know? <laughs> so I've, I've just lied. That is, uh, we are constantly... All of us want to make ourselves look better than, I, I want you yeah. to see the best version of me. And, and so mm. I just kind of gild the lily. Exactly, yeah. that's right. That's why this is the most, I, I, I say it in the book, it's the hardest book I've ever written. Not because it's got the most difficult concepts uh, that I've ever grappled with, but because I've had to face up to my own lack of truthfulness mm -hmm. in my life and in, in past instances. And I, I'm not, you know, talking about huge, huge things, or, you know, but, but I'm, I'm talking about things that actually really, really do matter. Mm. Like lack and of if you're going to put yourself out on a platform writing about truth. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. But the great thing is, I mean, can I, can I get to Jesus now? Mm. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things that, that, uh, in that is, and, and the wonderful thing is that actually being a Christian is fundamentally about admitting that we're wrong mm -hmm. and that we're not truthful. That's, that's what it is. Uh, and that is something 
that we have as Christians that our world doesn't have. Mm -hmm. That is, our world uh, doesn't have the security in Jesus Christ to admit they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And so what we get is these polarized debates where everybody's got to be right and everybody's got to be constantly, you know, uh, you know can't, can't be proved wrong uh, because the alternative is if you prove wrong, then, th 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 then you've got nowhere to go. But we do have somewhere to go. We have Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in 1 John, uh, whoever, uh, you know, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves mm. and the truth is not in us. But we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm. And that's because of Jesus' death on the cross for us. So it all's got to come back to Jesus uh, in that fundamental way. And so that is, there is so much that we have. We, ha we have Jesus in this world. Uh, the, the, the modernism or the, the enlightenment will say there is objective truth, but it's impersonal. Mm -hmm. you know, objective truth is this abstract idea. Place out there. It's yeah. out there, that's mm -hmm. right. Postmodernism says there is no truth, or if there is, it, it, there's no objective truth, it's, it's in me. Mm -hmm. Subjective truth, uh, your truth, my truth. And then all we've got is a hold of different people who've got their own truths and everyone's just trying to win power by being the biggest victim. Mm -hmm. uh, what the Bible says is that truth is personal. And when I say it's personal, I don't mean that it's just subjective. It's not, but it operates at a personal level. It's about our personal relationships. And even more than that, it's about a person. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about God, the Father of Jesus Christ, who is truthful, who is faithful, who is committed to us, who keeps his word uh, and who speaks the truth about the world. And it's about Jesus, who in John's gospel uh, so often talks about truth. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Uh, when he confronts Pilate, the post-truth politician. Hmm. And he says, what is truth? Yeah, Pilate says, what is truth? Yeah. What he means by that is, yeah, I don't care. Yeah, what <laughs> is truth, John? Yeah. I don't know, since you're here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the answer is Jesus. Uh, in, 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 I mean, Jesus has told himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But... Yeah, uh, yeah, break yeah. it, give it, make yeah, break, it. Break, break, break that yeah, down. I've got, yeah, I can't let you get away yeah, with that. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Uh, just bringing that back to, to Jesus. In so, in so many ways, it's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in, in all of its uh, wonderful glory. That is, uh, in Ephesians, we come back to Ephesians, uh, what Paul says is that uh, when you heard, what does he say? Right at the beginning, chapter 1, verse 13, when you heard the word of truth, mm -hmm. and he defines it as the gospel of your salvation, you, be you heard, you believed, uh, and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Um, his, um, uh, his point is that the gospel is the word of truth. Now, what that means is that it's the gospel that speaks about God as our creator. It speaks about the fact that we ourselves are sinners and we need to come uh, to the Lord Jesus. It tells us the truth about ourselves, and it also tells us the truth about our world that it's a world that, yes, is God's world, and yet it is under sin, and yet Jesus himself is the one who redeems the world and indeed is where the world is heading, as mm -hmm. Ephesians says. Uh, also, as you get into, in Ephesians, into Ephesians chapter 4, uh, Paul says the truth is in Jesus uh, in Ephesians chapter 4. What, what does he mean by that? Uh, he's talking in, in uh, terms of, um, at that point, learning and teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, he's talking about living in Christian communities, He's talking about what does it actually mean for us to be holding on to this truth? And he says, the truth is in Jesus. And he's actually talking about the words of Jesus and what we know about Jesus. And so I think there he's actually referring to the, the traditions about Jesus, uh, which uh, we have in the Gospels. Uh, Jesus' words, Jesus' actions, what we know about Jesus, that's where the truth is. Okay. Mm. You've just done a little riff from Ephesians. Mm. I was teaching on Ephesians when I crashed and burned. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to put on the hat yeah. of the members of the congregation yeah. <laughs> and, and yes. push you into my corner. Yes, okay. okay. And um, play devil's advocate mm. with you. Mm. So, Lionel. Mm. How can this be possibly true mm. when we have churches claiming to be evangelical who have radically different view on gender roles? Mm. You know? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> so if you've got the assumption... Or Baptists and Presbyterians. Or Baptists and Presbyterians. Or, 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 well, actually, no, let's not 
debate church government, Let, let's say Protestants and Catholics, you know, okay, or yes. people who believe in the second blessing of the Spirit and people who think there's one blessing of the Spirit. Mm, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, the Protestant and Catholic, this is not, this is not a, a, a modern debate, that is. No, That's no. gone back to the Reformation. And yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. But, but how can it be the case? If, you know. So if you assume, as, as so many of us do, and we, without even realising it, the, the air that we breathe tells us that the truth is located just in ourselves. Mm -hmm. The air that we breathe tells us that uh, we have just assume that really there's no objective truth out there. Which is really Prince Harry's position. It's Prince Harry's position, yeah. exactly. Now, we assume that without even realising it. That's and, just what we... we and think. in the church, we've probably imbibed, imbibed mm. that as well. You're a great devil's advocate. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to have you in. <laughs> right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. yeah, thanks, sir. Thanks for that. Now, um, the, 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 the fact that we have imbibed it. And so what we're doing is we're, so, so what's, what's behind that question? What's behind that question is, if we disagree, then how are we going to ever know the truth? And the assumption is that there is no truth out there that stands above us. There's just us. There's just what you think and what you think and what you think. And if there's, you know, three of us who think something different on these questions, then the assumption is there's no objective truth that, that stands outside of us. But if Jesus is the objective truth that stands outside of us, what we can do is come humbly to him, come to his word and seek to say, I might be wrong. God's word is true. Jesus is true. What does Jesus have to say about this? this which is not going to necessarily be easy. It's not as if there's going to be, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come straight to God's word. And then five seconds later, we're all going to know exactly what the truth is. Uh, Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter 4 in terms of learning and teaching, educational mm. uh, language he uses there when he says the truth is in Jesus. What he's saying is Jesus is almost the curriculum. This is what we're actually seeking to learn together, speaking the truth in love, growing together. So if we have a shared commitment to knowing that, that, to the fact that there is truth in Jesus and that it stands outside of ourselves and that we may be wrong, uh, and so we need to submit ourselves to God's word rather than just dig in and belligerently hold on to our own views, as we're trained constantly to do by mm -hmm. social media. Uh, then we can keep seeking after the truth. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that in every uh, aspect we might, we, we might agree. But that, that was the criticism that the Catholics leveled against the Protestants in the Reformation. Uh, they said, well, you know, if, if truth is just about God's word and people uh, will just interpret God's word in different ways, then that ends in chaos. What you need is, and what they said is not Jesus, an, an but authoritative magistrate. Us. Yeah. Exactly. You need us. Yeah. yeah. And that actually doesn't, that doesn't work either. You know, and, and even at the time of the Reformation, uh, you had the Catholic Church, but you also had the Eastern Orthodox yeah. you know, churches and, and others. It so, can't you know. possibly work at the moment with Pope Francis flip-flopping. Like, oh, exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, in he's perhaps just a more spectacular everybody. way than previous popes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That, that's a whole other thing. My, my friend Mark Gilbert says that Pope Francis is very Catholic in the sense that he's just trying to include everybody. Yeah. Yep. So he's not as interested in, in the dogma. He's yep. much more interested in just inclusion, yep. uh, which is in our world a powerful thing. Let's mm. just hug everybody. Back, uh, to, yeah. back, to, yeah, sorry. <laughs> back to unity. Sorry, it was yeah. me who took us off on that mm. side. Mm. But, um, you got to 2 Corinthians mm. and you described 2 Corinthians as a worked example of mm. speaking the truth in love. That mm. here was a moment where we were in disagreement and mm. take me through that. How does that work? Yes, 2 Corinthians. Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. 2 Corinthians is um, a, a snapshot of a very, very fraught relationship that Paul mm -hmm. has with his, uh, with, with the church in Corinth. Mm. Uh, in Ephesians, uh, he's speaking uh, generally uh, about how things work. In 2 Corinthians, uh, we, under, we see an example of where things really are not working. Mm. Uh, what I've actually done uh, in, in 2 Corinthians is um, uh, you know, I identified uh, the various issues that we have in our world, like misinformation, uh, power plays, uh, issues of uh, just mistrust, um, mm. then uh, and spiritual abuse, uh, various things that are going on in our, in our world. You can see them all there in 2 Corinthians. Mm. Now, that's uh, what, what I've tried to do in the book. The book's mainly for, for, for your average Christian to mm. read, uh, but I've also, at the end of each uh, part two and part three, um, sought to 
talk about things that are particularly relevant for pastors. Mm. Uh, and so 2 Corinthians is one of them. Uh, here's Paul. Uh, he's dealing with a very complex situation. He's had uh, people saying things about him. He's had to change his plans, but people have imputed false motives to him. Um, or did he change his plans? Well, it's hard to know, mm. but people are saying that he did. And he's saying, you know, I didn't change my plans because I was being um, fickle. fickle. Yeah. I, I did it for you I, I, yeah. out of love and uh, questions uh, about uh, Which his, his it, motives. It's all the, the normal problems. It's the normal churches, problems that pass his face, yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, he's even facing this issue of he's being gentle with them. Yeah. And so he's got these uh, th th these powerful, so he calls them super apostles, mm. who come along and say, oh, he's being gentle with you. Oh, well, that's just a trick. You know, that's just, that's just, yeah, he's too weak. You know, you mm. need to follow us. And so no matter what he does, he's facing both the super apostles and the Corinthians themselves um, in this, 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 this deep uh, and difficult and complex situation. Mm. And so what I do there is I explore, well, what does he actually do in that situation? Mm. Because the letter is him telling the Corinthians what he does mm. uh, and him actually doing it uh, mm. at the very same time. And there's various things that he does. So a worked example of we're pursuing unity in the faith. We're mm. pursuing um, unity and understanding Jesus. Mm. Um, and living for him. And too. living for him in agreement mm. about that. Mm. And we're working through the messiness of our life yes. to achieve that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. I, I said to you before that um, as I was reading your chapter, I, I remember watching from a distance, well, from Sydney to Seattle, watching Mars Hill implode all those mm. years ago back in 2014 yeah. and writing to Driscoll. Yes. Um, and I don't know if he ever got my email, but... Mm. Um, mm. Uh, but writing to him suggesting, I reckon it would be maybe possible to pull this back together if you taught through two Corinthians humbly, you know, because <laughs> okay. they were in a mess, you know. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, yes. and I just thought, I wonder whether or not you could have humbly, because said, well, I got this wrong and I got that wrong and we've got mm. it together to work to unity in the mm. faith. And mm. it could just could have been the master class of understanding what Paul was trying to do. Yeah. It may well have been. Uh, I mean, to, history obviously isn't, didn't play out that yeah. way. And I, I, again, I don't know all the details of, of, of the situation, but uh, I actually, I had in the back of my mind, there was a podcast about Mars Hill and, you know, the, um, w whether that was fully accurate or not. The, 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 the One of the, the key chapters in 2 Corinthians uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul talks about repentance. Mm. Uh, and so I've got a chapter of repentance. Yeah. Uh, and what repentance actually is. You know, repentance, in our world, often repentance is saying, I'm sorry, um, and then just keeping on doing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, or that kind of uh, politician's apology, I'm sorry that uh, you took me the wrong way. Mm. Or I'm sorry that, you, you know, you've done the wrong, you know, you, you, mm. you've, you've misunderstood me. Uh, and that kind of regret that's not actually repentance. Mm. Uh, now, what do we do um, as pastors today mm. in this world? Because mm. my, my suspicion is some of my peers are, well, we're not running towards this as an issue, do you know? Mm, yeah. And yes. I feel like your book is a call for us mm. to run towards trying to change mm. the hearts of our people on yes. this issue. I think that's what your, yes. your thesis is. That's, that's, a, that's a large part of it. That's right. And that is what it is. Um, I want uh, to, to, to see um, and have seen, in fact, you know, but even more so. Uh, communities transformed by this truth and this confidence in the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus and living it out. The subtitle of the book is deliberate. It's uh, living truthfully mm -hmm. in a post-truth world. As, as pastors and as Christians, uh, we are very conservative. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is we're often about 15 to 20 years behind mm. <laughs> the zeitgeist. So in, in some ways, we're kind of still in, and I'm, I'm, I lumped myself in there, I was, I, you know, before reading these books, we're still in that, that time of, oh, well, people don't really believe in truth. You know, people don't think there's such a thing as truth. Um, now, that is certainly the case in our world. But there is a growing movement in our world uh, to say, 
this is terrible. Mm. Uh, this whole idea that there's no such thing as truth. You know, so Barack Obama is just the, ex- the mm. example of that. But th- my, my friend in the ABC, you know, th- there's a whole lot of people who are saying, if we so don't the swing back truth, is happening, or not, not necessarily, yeah. well, the, not necessarily the swing back, yes. but the swing off post-modernity yeah. to where? To, to nowhere. And so we have it. <laughs> We have the truth. We have, when I say we have the truth, I don't mean we've got the absolute truth that we can wield as a weapon against everybody. What we've got is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have that uh, ability, we have the ability to say we're wrong. Mm -hmm. We have the ability to repent, uh, not because we're great, but because we have Jesus. We have that security in him. And we have the spirit at work in our lives to transform us to be more like him, to live truthfully. And that is a, that's a powerful thing. Mm. Uh, I, I think we, we can often say, oh, well, we're, we're in a world that doesn't really believe in objective truth. And so we need to sort of downplay that a little bit and instead play up more sort of relational kind of things. And that's, that's right. Uh, we do need to be talking about relationships. But relationships work when there is truth. And if we just abandon truth without relationships, then we get, well, love, but it's an insipid love that's just fuzzy and doesn't follow through. Or we get the idea of loyalty without truth, which ends up being uh, tyranny and fosters abuse. You know, you've got to just be loyal, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we all just have to, you know, be committed to one another. Well, if you just say we have to be committed to one another without truth, without that Jesus um, standing above us, and giving us that sense that we need to keep coming back to him in, in repentance and faith, then we end up in the sort of same kind of tyrannies that the world is starting to realise uh, is, is a real problem. So we have, we have this wonderful thing. And so uh, to, to live in communities of truth, which is my final chapter, to foster communities of truth, where we are both uh, living, where we're speaking the truth in love, where we're doing both of those things, mm. where uh, we, are, we are loving and truthful because that's what God is. Mm. Uh, God is the one who is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Mm. Uh, those two words, uh, chesed emet, uh, truth and love. So that's what I want to call people to. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Dominic. My guest on The Pastor's Heart, Lionel Windsor. He is the author of Truth Be Told, Living Truthfully in a Post-Truth World, out now from Matthias Media. My name's Dominic Steele. You've been with us on The Pastor's Heart. We'll look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon. 